Armstrong, and this is VOA One, the hits. <laughs> Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program. Katie Weaver has a report on dangers facing Rohingya Muslims. Later, Dan Novak and Dan Friedel present this week's education report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series, "The Making of a Nation." But first, here is Katie Weaver. The United Nations says the possible sinking of a boat carrying Rohingya Muslims would make 2022 one of the deadliest at sea for that group. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees said it believes a boat that set sail at the end of November is missing. All 180 on board. Are feared dead. The agency said it feared the boat may have started to break apart in early December before losing contact. The UNHCR said it was not clear where the boat had launched from, but three Rohingya men, including one whose family was on board. Said it set sail from Bangladesh. Nearly one million Rohingya from Myanmar are living in crowded camps in Muslim-majority Bangladesh. The number includes tens of thousands who fled their home country after Myanmar's military carried out a deadly operation against the minority group in 2017. Rights groups have estimated the number of Rohingya leaving Bangladesh by boat rose to nearly two thousand four hundred this year. It was not clear how the lifting of COVID nineteen restrictions in Southeast Asia has affected the flow from Bangladesh. In Buddhist majority Myanmar, most Rohingya are denied citizenship. And are seen as illegal immigrants from South Asia. Babar Baloch is a UNHCR spokesperson. He told Reuters news agency that nearly two hundred Rohingya were already feared dead or missing at sea this year. We hope against hope that the one hundred eighty missing are still alive somewhere. Officials in Thailand said four women and one man were recently found floating near Thailand's Surin Island, and rescued by fishermen. Another woman was rescued near the country's Similan Islands. Officials were not able to confirm their identities. A local fisherman told Reuters he and his crew. Had rescued people holding on to a floating water tank. Baloch said, "2022 was one of the worst years for Rohingya deaths and disappearances after 2013 and 2014. The earlier years are when 900 and 700 Rohingya died or went missing in the Andaman Sea." And the Bay of Bengal, off the southern coasts of Myanmar and Bangladesh, UN officials said violence between communities within the group forced them to flee. Syed Rahman is a 38-year-old man who fled to Malaysia in 2012 from Myanmar. He told Reuters his wife and three children. Were among the missing on the vessel. 
In 2017, my family came to Bangladesh to save their lives, Rahman said. But they are now all gone. I'm totally devastated. We Rohingya are left to die, on the land, at sea, everywhere. I'm Katie Weaver. As many areas of daily life continued to move past the pandemic in 2022, problems in the classroom show how far the recovery still has to go. Almost two school years of full or partial distant learning left many students behind academically. When schools moved online, Some students simply did not attend class. Others struggled behaviorally and socially. Although many of the problems existed before the pandemic, the virus made things worse. Schools are now facing a double crisis of learning and mental health. Education equity also worsened. When schools closed, countries' teaching and learning methods differed greatly around the world, found a study by the International Association for the Evaluation of Educational Achievement, IEA, and UNESCO. The organizations researched teaching and learning methods used in 11 countries on five continents during the pandemic. The study found that some countries were able to quickly move to online learning, but others were simply not able to make the change. In the European countries of Denmark and Slovenia, for example, More than 95% of students could use laptop computers for schoolwork, but in the African countries of Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, and Kenya, fewer than 10% of students had laptops. Overall, 10% of students said they did not have the resources to complete their schoolwork at least most of the time. In the United States, many states saw large increases in the number of students who had to repeat grades. Traditionally, experts say repeating a grade can hurt a child's social life and academic future. But many parents have asked for their children to repeat grades to help them recover from the difficulties of online learning, quarantines, and school worker shortages. The Associated Press examined data from 26 states plus the District of Columbia in the most recent academic year. It found that 22 of the states, plus D.C., saw an increase in the number of students who were retained or held back a year. This autumn, United Nations leaders called on nations to improve basic learning skills. UNICEF found that two out of every three children around the world cannot read and understand a simple story by age 10. This was a 12% increase since before the pandemic. Three-quarters of children by grade 4 also do not have basic math skills. In poorer countries, the numbers are even worse. Just one in ten children in sub-Saharan Africa have basic reading skills by grade three. This is a global learning crisis, said UNICEF director Catherine Russell. Millions of children are still out of school, and millions of children are in school but not learning the basic skills. Often, the subject students have had the most difficulty in was math. 
the National Assessment of Education Progress, or NAEP, is a math and reading test given to 4th and 8th grade students in public schools around the U.S. Results from this year showed that students' scores had the largest decrease in math since 1990, when the test was first released. All areas of the U.S. reported lower test scores in math. More than one-third of students scored below basic levels. The decreases were also more severe in math than in reading. The pandemic has also brought attention to both student and teacher mental health. In the IEA UNESCO study, a majority of students in eight countries questioned said their emotional well-being suffered during the pandemic. Teachers also felt the emotional effects of the pandemic. In India, for example, 85% of teachers said they needed additional mental health support. In Russia, 64% of teachers reported feeling tired most of the time. And a majority of teachers in several countries were afraid of being infected with COVID while working. Many countries are listening to what teachers and students say they need. In most countries studied, 50% of schools increased support for students and teachers. Many school leaders reported an increase in the use of school guidance counselors and other mental health resources during the pandemic. Teachers also provided more help to students with their emotional and physical health. But in the U.S., school systems are seeing a shortage of school psychologists. Chalkbeat found that among 18 of the country's largest school systems, 12 started the year this autumn with fewer counselors or psychologists than they had in the autumn of 2019. As a result, many school mental health professionals must work with the high number of cases that go beyond recommended limits, experts say. Many students are having to wait for urgently needed help. There have been signs students are starting to make up for lost time in the classroom. The Northwest Evaluation Association, or NWEA, found that American students made gains in reading and math during the 2021-2022 school year compared to the year before. But experts say the recovery from COVID-19 will last years longer than available financial support. The U.S. government has given billions of dollars in aid to help school systems recover from the pandemic. But they must spend the money by 2024. Experts agree that students who have fallen behind are going to need a lot of attention. Dirk Hasted is the executive director of IEA, which helped lead the study of teaching and learning methods in 11 countries. He said that in all countries, there was concern for the poorest and most at-risk students. Poorer students and students already struggling were the ones who suffered the most during school disruptions. Many could not access digital resources. Many students' families suffered financially from the pandemic, which likely affected their schooling. Some had to spend time caring for family members. In Kenya, for example, 63% of students said one of their parents lost their job during the pandemic. Hasted said policymakers need to find a way 
to reach the students hurting the most. The task for the future is how can we get these students up to speed again so we don't lose them completely and they fall behind even more, he said. I'm Dan Novak. And I'm Dan Friedel. You just heard Dan Novak and Dan Friedel present this week's education report. Dan Novak joins me now to talk more about the story. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me. Your story looks back at the big education issues of 2022. If you could choose a theme or main idea for this year in education, what would it be? I would say the theme is recovery. Many areas of life have changed because of the pandemic. Arguably, schools and learning have been most severely impacted. This year, we really saw the effects of two years of online learning. Many students have fallen far behind academically, especially poorer students and those that had already been struggling. Schools were also facing a mental health crisis. Do you think schools have been able to recover? I think the recovery has begun, but there is still a long way to go. There is some good news. The Northwest Evaluation Association found that American students made gains in reading and math during the 2021 to 2022 school year. But education experts agree that students that fell behind are going to need a lot of extra help to catch up. And I think it's important to remember as well that Certain inequalities in education have existed for a long time. The pandemic didn't create these inequalities, but rather made them worse. Countries and school systems are going to have to think creatively to help students recover. And experts say governments are going to need to make big investments in education for years to come. That makes sense. Thanks for joining me, Dan. You're welcome. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. By the summer of 1862, the American Civil War had been going on for more than a year. The Union had won some battles. The Confederacy had won others. But neither side was in a position to win the war. President Abraham Lincoln needed a major victory. He was losing the support of both politicians and the public. A major victory would not only help him that way, it would also make it easier for him to make an important announcement. For a number of months, he had been planning an announcement about the black people held as slaves in the South. Today, Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe tell about Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. At the end of August 1862, Confederate troops under the command of Robert E. Lee defeated the main Union army at Manassas, Virginia. The battlefield was less than 50 kilometers from Washington. The year before, Confederate troops had sent the Union Army fleeing from that same battlefield. Now they had done it again. With this latest victory, General Lee decided on a major move. He would carry the war into the northern states. Lee took his army of 60,000 men across the Potomac River into Maryland. He ordered some of his men to capture the Union position at Harper's Ferry. He moved the others to Sharpsburg, a town on the Potomac River. He put his men into position along Antietam Creek, just outside of town. His lines extended almost three kilometers. There, 
at Antietam, he would make his stand. He was still close enough to Virginia to withdraw if the Union force following him proved too strong. The Union force arrived in the middle of September. It did not attack immediately. It spent one full day getting into position along Antietam Creek, across from the Confederate Army. It attacked the following day at sunrise. The Union general, George McClellan, planned to attack all along the Confederate line at the same time. But this did not happen. First, Union troops attacked one end of the line which extended into a field full of tall corn plants. Then they attacked the center of the line, which was in an old, deeply sunken road that gave it good protection. Finally, they attacked at the other end of the line. For each northern attack, General Lee was able to move men to where they were needed. The northern troops got within 25 meters of the Confederate line, but they could not break through anywhere. On the first day of battle at Antietam, Lee lost 25% of his men. On the second day, the two armies faced each other without firing. They were too tired to fight. As they rested, however, fresh Union soldiers moved into position. Lee knew they would attack with full force the next day. He knew he could not win. Sadly, he ordered his men back to Virginia. It was now clear Antietam was a northern victory. It was not a complete victory. The Union Army could have chased the Confederate Army and destroyed it. But General McClellan did not do this. He was satisfied that he had stopped the invasion. In Washington, President Lincoln welcomed the news. He had waited a long time for a northern victory. A few days after the battle, Lincoln held a special meeting with his cabinet. He talked about the Declaration on Slavery which he had prepared. It would free Negro slaves in the rebel states of the South. As you remember, he said, I put the Declaration aside several weeks ago until I could issue it supported by a military victory. The action of the army against the rebels has not been exactly what I should have liked, but the rebels have been driven out of Maryland, and Pennsylvania is no longer in danger of invasion. President Lincoln said he thought the time was right to announce the Emancipation Proclamation. The cabinet made some minor changes in the document, and Lincoln signed it. Newspapers printed the proclamation. This is what it said. I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, do hereby declare that on the first day of January, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state then in rebellion against the United States shall then become and be forever free. The government of the United States, including the military and naval forces, will recognize and protect the freedom of such persons and will interfere in no way with any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. President Lincoln had tried to keep the question of slavery out of the Civil War. To him, 
There was just one reason for fighting, to save the Union. Nothing meant more to him than preventing the nation from splitting up. Lincoln feared that the issue of slavery would weaken the Northern war effort. Many men throughout the North would fight to save the Union. They would not fight to free the slaves. Lincoln also needed the support of the four slave states that did not leave the Union, Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, and Missouri. He could not be sure of their support if he declared that the purpose of the war was to free the slaves. As Lincoln waited for a Union victory to announce his Emancipation Proclamation, he wrote a letter to the New York Tribune newspaper. The letter was to prepare the public for what was to come. This is what Lincoln said. My chief object in this struggle is to save the Union. It is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. This is how I see my official duty. It does not change my wish as a person that all men everywhere could be free. President Lincoln failed to keep the question of slavery out of the Civil War. As the war went on, month after long month, people in the North began to see it as more than a struggle for national unity. They began to see it as a struggle for human freedom. Abolitionists were active. In speeches and writings, they said over and over again that slavery was evil. As public opinion began to change, anti-slavery members of Congress gained more power. By the summer of 1862, they had enough support to pass laws ending slavery in Washington, D.C. and United States territories. They also pushed through Congress a bill that would do much to end slavery in the states. The bill was called the Confiscation Act. It gave the federal government the power to confiscate or seize the property of all persons who supported the Southern Rebellion. Slaves were considered property. So any slaves seized under the act would become free immediately. Slaves who escaped from rebel slave owners also would be free. The bill would not affect slaves owned by persons who supported the Union. President Lincoln did not like the Confiscation Act. He thought it interfered with his wartime powers as commander-in-chief. However... Lincoln was under great pressure from abolitionists, so he signed the new law, but he did not plan to enforce it. He still hoped for a plan that would free the slaves slowly, over time. He proposed such a plan, but only for the border states between North and South. Under his plan the federal government would buy slaves in the border states and free them. Lawmakers from the border states rejected Lincoln's plan, and that is when he decided to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And that's our program for today. 
Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley.